uh, he was asking what I thought of the scholar and I, I'm hoping, I've got to, is there one here? No, there's not one here because I was hoping to have a look today and I wanted to see the new canon that was announced and stuff. No, um, I mean the scholar, the, I suppose it's, I, I've, I follow the websites like everybody else, it, it was literally announced when I was born I think, wasn't it? Um, and so in a way it's, there's a bit of a negativity attached to it because obviously a lot of people who are, wanted to go out and make documentaries and stuff, I think we were hoping there was going to be a two third inch version and, and so what they set out to do obviously changed but I think as a camera in its own right, if you forget the history of the nightmare of how long it's taken to actually appear, uh, it looks really exciting. I think, I think from my perspective, I'm not a big one for, for my own personal camera, for having to add on too much. I like something to come pretty much, if you want to shoot with it at that size, you know, it's got a screen and, and I think, uh, I mean, I don't know too much about the Scarlet, but I've always found with the red cameras, <laughs> when I look at, on This Is England, we shot, the like, first time I used it on This Is England 86, I sort of saw this body, and that's really tiny, you know, how great's that? And then they brought it onto set with like a behemoth lens and once it was all put together I was like, what's that? Where's that thing that was in the box back there? And that's like buried in there look, and that's the rest of it. <coughs> yeah, on This Is England 86 we use 7D in some of the fight scenes and red and then 88 is basically F3 red and, and a tiny, tiny bit of 7D. Um, and for the Stone Roses documentary um, I'm hoping to use uh, two F3s, maybe a an EX1R, but I'm hoping there's a new one of those coming out before I start, but I don't, I don't know whether it will or not. Um, and then, you know, these new, um, really portable, like, Nex cameras, because I want to get stuff of the band, like, literally in places, really unorthodox places, but try and keep that depth of field, the 35mm depth of field, so I won't be using any tiny cameras for doing any major handheld movement work because of the, the rolling sensor, you know, the CMOS uh, problem. Um, but, so I'm, I'm going to you know, I'm always incorporating smaller cameras, but I, you know, in terms of the big interview stuff, the main stuff that you'll see, it will be uh, F3s with S-Log and probably looking at the Samurai or something like that, because I don't really need 444 because the file size is, you know, gigantic, but I'll probably shoot it at 422 to help the grade and the jobs are good, hopefully. Yes, mate? You have to pass it down. I'm so sorry. Could someone who can hear just shout it down? How quickly did you act upon um, doing the Stone Roses documentary? Ah, cool. So, how quickly did I act on the Stone Roses thing? It was, I was about, about three weeks ago, I was driving to a film festival to go to the airport to a film festival in France and um, someone had told me Ian Brown had been trying to get hold of me and wanted my number and um, I've spoken to him a few times and you know I know him a bit and, 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 and he had my number but I change it regularly so I uh, sent my number through and I got a phone call in this taxi and uh, he told me the Stone Roses are getting back together you know and I was just like obviously they're like my old time favourite band so uh, the first thing I said was if you let anybody else film it I'll kill you I hope you're ringing to ask me to film it because I have to do that. And uh, so I was kind of like, I mean, they, you know, from my point of view, I'm not a documentary filmmaker, um, but obviously Scorsese is kind of one of my heroes. And the way that he, because of his love of music, will go and make documentaries about musicians and can do it because he's a filmmaker. Um, I'm hoping that, that applies to me and it's not rubbish because, um, uh, you know, I'm, but, you know, like I say, it was one of those jobs that I just said I have to do that. And I was planning to make a, a big feature film in the summer next year, like a, a 10 million pound feature, but I've just pushed it to the side, literally just so I can do that, um, which I could be here in two years with a fucking cap in my hand, regretting it. Uh, but um, yeah, so I, I acted incredibly quickly. And um, although it's not completely signed off yet, you know, um, I'm, you know, fingers crossed it happens. So. Yes, sorry at the back, mate. Uh, what are your thoughts on the F101? Have you tried, have you used the Panasonic uh, kind of F101? Yeah, I, I've used the, uh, I, I did some, I tested it recently because I was doing the, because it auto focuses. Um, I tested it um, when I, the Stone Roses asked me to go and shoot the press conference, so I got an AF101 because the F3, I didn't want, I didn't know what was going to happen on this day at the, um, at the press conference because the F3 is completely manual focus and I was told I literally would have to operate myself and um, 
I just thought to myself, I don't want to take the risk of the first thing I shoot with them being soft in places, and so I needed an autofocus camera, so I tried it um, at the time, and uh, actually stands up, as a, I, I love the form of it, I know a lot of people like going, oh it looks weird, and I love how it looks, I think it's a beautiful little thing, price-wise it's incredible, but it was like on the actual autofocus side, um, just purely from a technical standpoint of view, it sort of hunted either side, and it wasn't a very natural drift into focus for me. And I know most people won't use autofocus on it, but I needed something very specifically that I could run and gun with on the day. And I was shooting it myself on my shoulder, and when I was doing tests and stuff, I found it would drift past and pull back to something, which felt very mechanical. It felt like it didn't feel like a, an operator was doing it. It obviously was a little servo doing it on the camera's behalf. So um, had that been better, I probably would have shot the first day on that, but I ended up doing it on an EX1R just because the auto, I found out, I tried a Canon X F305, which was amazingly fast at auto focusing, but just not good enough in the low light, because the, the conference was in this really dark room. So the EX1R got the call simply because the autofocus was pretty good, but it was just brilliant in low light, and the autofocus looked a bit more natural to my eye, so I did test with it, um, and it nearly kind of, you know, got called upon, so. Price-wise, I think it's pretty unbeatable, really, for the bang for buck. Yes, mate. Yeah, so what decision-making process goes on to use which format of camera? Um, I mean, when... Um, the, the main reason to move from film to digital came about because as a filmmaker there was a thing called a ratio uh, that doesn't exist in digital world which was the film ratio if they the insurance company know your project's meant to be 90 minutes that a ratio starts to develop based on what you're shooting every day on film stock and I had I had the highest one ever with this insurance company it was like 170 to 1 about two weeks in, and the, and the cost of film is all, you know, there's a cost per reel to develop, and obviously they're looking at it going, you know, this is absolutely insane, and they try to make you shrink that ratio down to something more normal. Um, and so part of my reason for wanting to jump to digital was because it wasn't restrictive like that, it wasn't like, you weren't financially bound, obviously you need hard drives and things and more of that, so there's certain cost implications, but it's not like a thousand pound a reel or whatever, which was insane at the time. So the reason I desperately wanted to go from 35 and 16 to digital was for creative reasons, so that I could shoot more material without having people ringing me up saying I had to stop doing it. Um, and then when it comes to, um, like when we shot the fight scene, and this is England 86, where the guy turns up, who's the, the funny guy Flip, and he turns up to, you know, to sort of pick on Sean, and, um, it, it was just a simple case of getting those extra things that you kind of, you know, you've got two cameras, but I'd set someone up with, I think, with an EX1 7D running around in there. So you've got an extra body running around amongst it. Um, but you're getting, those kind of cameras can do things. Because when you've got someone with a shoulder mount here, there is obviously certain, you can't literally take it off your body and turn it under someone's face. You can't, th you know, you, there's, a, there's a certain physical restriction, although you're handheld and you're quite liberated little cameras, digital SLRs, can do things that those bigger units, those rigs can't do, and can get to places that they can't do, and in used in moderation in, in the cuts, you tend to find that it's pretty seamless. When you look at, when I look at, especially handheld footage from digital SLRs, uh, it's not very forgiving on bumps, and you know, and it, so you have to pick and choose. Obviously, where they do shine is when they're on tripods. You look at 5D films that have been made reasonably static, or with pretty smooth handheld stuff, they're, they're amazing, but um, so I've always sort of found that when I'm looking for shots in high octane sequences, light fight sequences and things like that, that that's when you call in, and so whether it be these next cameras or whether it be GF2s, or you know, if it, a GH2, sorry, um, in the Stone Roses documentary, it'll be because I can get them stuck on a cymbal looking down at a drummer's drumstick or at the end of a guitar where you wouldn't want to use a main camera, you know. Yes, mate. So you're a very uh, technical director. I mean, is it a case that you often end up um, clashing with the DP a lot then in terms of your choice of cameras, your choice of, in terms of very an organic flow between the two of 
Um, yeah, I, I suppose it. Um, if you have conflict with the DP over, I, I suppose it does happen. It's happened with me in the past, the people that I've worked in, where because I'm quite into my technology, um, you know, I, I've had you know moments where you have disagreed about. You know, in the early days, I was just blown away that I had a motion picture camera. You know, I've been gone from high eights to a 35 mil rig, and I was able to sit on a crane, and I was like, I felt like Alfred Hitchcock floating about, you know. So that I, I never asked a question. I just was like, went in the cinema, watched it blown up, watched rushes, black and white rushes. I felt like I was like on the set of Raging Bull or something, you know. It was like blew my mind. And then obviously, as as time goes on and you learn yourself, you know, you get to a point where you become a bit more educated, and you kind of go, well. Yeah, that was soft, that one, and they go, no, it wasn't, you know, you have these little things, but the, the guy that I work with now, Danny Cohen, is a bit like me, he's, um, he's a, he he's always knows the cameras that are on the horizons, just as excited about what's coming as what you're using now, so he's as much, it's like a sort of two children in a sweet shop thing, he tells me, I remember when the Minima came out, the little 16mm camera, and he shows me shots of how someone used a camera, and he's really excitable, and just as much as I am, so... But at the same time, you know, you kind of, what I've learned, the first time I used a red, if I'm honest, was a bit of a nightmare technically. The heating up, um, the camera was just a nightmare. It was a pig, honestly. It was an absolute pig. There was a point at which the DOP got a hammer to smash it up because it just was so unreliable. Um, it looked, not you know, not picture-wise, but actually, because I was shooting in council houses and, you know, um, it was heating up really badly and uh, overheating and then with all the upgrades and even through the course of the shoot some firmware things came out and it literally improved over a six week period and then when we used it this time around it was a completely different story um, it was pretty seamless I think we maybe had one or two crashes in an entire shoot which is no different than having a lock up on a film reel where you get a hair in the gate or a jam on a mag you know you have to accept certain things um, but uh, yeah so the long and short of it is, is that you know, he's just as bad as me, and uh, it's probably the producers are trying to stop us hiring in every camera known to man and trying to talk people into sending us over prototypes of stuff. Because um, I, I got really excited about an, a really small company in Sweden that were making a new Super 8 camera and it never went into production. Um, they're called Iconoscope, I think. And I was like ringing them saying, you know, please make it. You know, I'd love a little new Super 8 camera that I can use. So I'm a, I'm a sod for it, you know. Luckily, so's Danny.